Dex went over the plan again in his head, covering all the angles. He'd be taking his life into his hands when he went to go steal from Geno's, and he knew it. Even with his special talent, he knew things could go south pretty quick. Geno's was a big family-owned grocery store, but most everybody understood that the family in question was the mob. Unlike most of their washing operations, Gino was old blood, and this was as close to retirement as he was likely to get. He didn't like kids, especially not black kids, and Dex was already taking a chance by even trying it. But what he did know was that Gino was going to be busy when he went to go get his bread. You see, Gino was going to be fixing his circuit box when Dex came in, and with Grizz behind the counter, no one would be able to stop him. Dex had planned the whole thing out, he and the weird boys. The gang was less of a capital G gang, and more of a protective group for street kids labeled as weird. Some of it was regular stuff. Clubfoot Steve, Bald Mary, Hops. They were kids who, through bad luck or whatever, were a little different. Dex, on the other hand, was even more different. He and Wizard were weird with a capital W, and they knew it. Smoke was weird too, but his was a little less explainable, though infinitely more useful. You see, smoke could disappear. Not like go invisible, but he seemed to make everything around him more interesting to look at. As long as smoke stayed absolutely still, he could remain undetectable. They had used it a few times to get away with stuff, but it had proved difficult the last time they hit Geno's. Since he couldn't move, Smoke was stuck until he got an opening. Gino had chased him down the road and swung his bat and yelled some words you probably weren't allowed to say anymore as he ran off. And Smoke had just barely made it out of there with his life. Wizard could make electronics break if he concentrated. He could even fry cars, though it gave him a nosebleed. Then there was Dex. Dex could use the brain blast. Brain Blast was what they called it, but it didn't quite do it justice. Dex could concentrate on something, sometimes holding up his hands to his temple like Charles Xavier in the X-Men comics he liked to read, and send out a wave of air or energy or something. He'd used it to knock people over when they chased him, and he even broke some windows once with it, but it always left him kind of drained afterwards. Dex was careful how often he used it, and he was up to three times a day, before the effort gave him a total migraine. That's why they were called the Weird Boys, and the other gangs knew not to mess with them. Well, some of them did. The plan was going to go down right around sunset, just as the street lights came on, and Dex wanted to go over it again before the time came. Come on, man, Wizard said, the rubber ball he was tossing making a hollow chunk sound as it hit the wall. It ain't rocket surgery. We know what to do. They were sitting in the clubhouse, an old storage container that someone had been careless enough to leave unlocked and stupid enough to leave in downtown Detroit unattended. The kids had grabbed some throwaway furniture and built a home in it, probably the coziest any of them had ever known. Dex had been in 13 foster homes before he finally just took to the streets, and the clubhouse was better than any of them. No one took your money and gave you abuse in return in the clubhouse. Fine, Dex said, letting his feet slide off the milk crate they'd been sitting on. Then let's hear it. Wizard blew out an angry breath. <sighs> I'm going to go into the back alley so I can blow the fuse box. Dex looked at Smoke, he and Clubfoot Steve playing spades with Bald Mary, and the boy jumped a little as he noticed him. Uh, I'm, I'm lookout. I gotta stand across the street and alert you if anything goes wrong. Dex nodded, satisfied with the plan. And I'll be inside, stealing our daily bread. Wizard had wanted to use Smoke again for the theft, but Dex didn't think it was a good idea after the last time. Smoke had gotten away, but he'd had nothing to show for his efforts, and the gang had gone hungry that night. What's worse, there was a chance that Gino would recognize him, and that would pooch the whole deal. They needed to be undetected, but they also needed to go unnoticed. After the last time, Smoke had been made lookout, and Dex decided to take matters into his own hands.
Reynolds hated these kinds of assignments. He and Drether had been sitting down the street from the packing container the kids lived in for about a week, and not a day went by that he didn't call his boss and ask if he was sure he wanted this one. They had snatched street kids before, and they usually weren't worth the trouble. They were willful, unsociable, and created problems where there didn't need to be any. Cutter would likely have a field day with this one, if Reynolds could get him, that was. They're planning something, Drether said, putting down the headphones as he picked up his soda cup from the holder. No shit, Reynolds said. They're street kids, Dre. They're always planning something. Drethers gave him a look and sucked the last few inches of drink out of his paper cup. They had put the bug in the container three days ago. It hadn't been hard. Their little gang was made of children, none of them old enough to shave yet. Dex and Wizard were probably the oldest, the site manager fixing Dex's age around 12, but the others were probably still capable of mixing in with elementary school kids. The site managers wanted Dex and Wizard, Dexter Monroe and William Cranby, but if it came to one or the other, they wanted Cranby more. We think that with some training, he might have more to offer than an electromagnet with attitude. Reynolds hoped so, because he'd been planning a date with his girlfriend this week, and hated to think that she was probably sleeping in someone else's bed because he was chasing a one-trick pony. The phone rang, vibrating in the empty cup holder, and Reynolds picked it up grumpily. Yeah, he asked, expecting Mike, but getting a shock. Is that how you answer the phone when I call Bartholomew? Reynolds sat up a little straighter. That had been the voice that had haunted his dreams when he'd slept in the beds these kids were preparing to occupy. Reynolds could remember the taste of this man's fingers as they split his lip when he was seven, the crack of thunder as he beat him senseless at eleven, and the disappointment when it had all been for naught and Reynolds had washed out. He could still hear him saying how much he regretted wasting those beatings on him, but that maybe there was something he could do to recoup their trouble. No, sir. S sorry, sir. Agent Reynolds reporting. The voice on the other end said nothing for a count of five, but Reynolds could hear the smile behind those thin lips at the fear he put into this grown man. Status? The boys are present. Something's going to happen later, and we believe we may be able to isolate them and take them. Drether gave him a look that conveyed his surprise expertly, but Reynolds waved him off. I should hope so. Seven days is a little much to grab two truant boys off the street. They rarely leave the group, sir, and as the site manual dictates, don't dictate site code to me, Bartholomew. I was writing them while you were still pissing the bed, though I seem to recall that wasn't all that long ago. Reynolds blushed and was glad that he hadn't just put the phone on speaker. Well, sir, if you would like to authorize some extra hands, I'm sure we could get this done without being seen. I would have thought two full-grown men could manage a snatch job on two half-grown boys. Abilities be damned. Either grab them and return tonight, or just return tonight and wear your incompetence. He hung up then, and Reynolds sat back as he ground his teeth. I'm guessing that wasn't Mike, said Drether, earning him a dark look from Reynolds. Nope. Change of plans. Surveillance is over. When these kids leave, we're following them. One way or another, we're coming home after tonight. Reynolds meant to come back with the boys. He was not about to let Security Chief Ridley make a fool of him. The overhead tone dinged cheerily as Dex walked in and he heard the old gangster clear his throat as he caught sight of him. Too late to back out now. It was do or die. Help you find something, boy? Gino asked, taking a step out from behind the counter. Dex could hear the sound of a broom on tile as he rounded the aisle, and Grizz came into view a few minutes later. Grizz was the antithesis of Gino. His patronage was open for debate and he was the only white guy Dex had ever seen with a full afro. His skin tone made everyone think he might be mixed race, but what races were mixed there was anyone's guess. 
Grizz was just shy of seven feet tall and was built like a linebacker. Supposedly, Grizz was somebody's nephew, and Gino hadn't had a lot of choice in hiring him. Despite his size, Grizz was just about the nicest guy you'd ever meet, and he sometimes gave the out-of-date food he pulled off the shelves to the homeless guys, despite Gino's orders to stop feeding the vags. He smiled when he saw Dex, but the smile curdled when he saw the top of Gino's shiny head coming their way. What remained of Gino's hair was scooped into a little ponytail at the nape of his neck. He was dressed in a butcher's apron, a pair of eldritch jeans gracing his small legs. He looked like someone had taken a full-grown man and set him on a pair of children's legs, and the rumors were that he had some kind of muscular disease that had facilitated his departure from the mob. Whatever was wrong with his legs, it didn't stop his big scarred hands from being very adept at violence. As Dex pretended to peruse the chip selection, one of those big hands found its way onto his shoulder, and he looked up to see Gino leaning down to talk in his ear. Listen here, I don't care if you got money or not. I'm not about to let you rob me blind while you pretend to... But he looked up suddenly as the bell chimed again, and straightened up when he saw a pair of men entering the store. He greeted them warmly, telling them to look around and let him know if he could help them. His smile faltered a little when one of them approached the deli counter, and Gino's fingers cut into Dex's shoulder. He eased up a moment later, telling the guy he'd be right there, but not before leaning down to issue another warning. I'll be watching you, boy. Any funny business, and I'll introduce you to something I should have shown your other little friend when he came in here to steal. Get your shit and get out. Grizz, he said. Make sure this customer finds the door, all right? Then he shuffled off on his small legs and told the fella he was sorry for the delay and asked what he could get for him. Grizz swept a little closer, clearly looking uncomfortable. Sorry, Dex, I, I don't have anything for you guys tonight. Gino's really busting my balls about giving out food, and I don't think I can help. It's okay, Grizz, I, I got money. I can pay for my stuff. Grizz looked relieved, sweeping closer to the counter as Dex loaded up his shopping basket with bread and meat. As he grabbed it, he wondered why the lights hadn't gone out yet. Where was Wizard? Had, had something happened? What was the holdup? Without much choice, Dex approached the register and laid out his purchases. A loaf of bread, a pack of bologna, a package of Kraft Singles, a bag of chips, a package of Mike and Ikes, Dex's favorite. He tried to look cool as Grizz rang it up, but inside his stomach was in knots. Why were the lights still on? Why had Wizard not killed the power? What in the hell was taking so long? All right, then. Your total's 1738, Grizz said, putting the bag down on the counter as he held out his hand. Dex reached into his pocket, contemplating grabbing the bag and making a run for it. And that's when it happened. Suddenly, the store went completely dark, and as the emergency lights came on, Dex grabbed the bag from Grizz and made a run for the front door. Gino yelled in anger, Grizz shouting about how the power had gone out, but Dex didn't realize his problem until he banged against the automatic door. He felt so stupid as he lay there, his purchases spilling out across the tile as his vision swam. No power meant no automatic door. He stood up, grabbing a few things and trying to orient himself. He had to go. He had to move. And as someone grabbed his arm, he twisted away and made a run for the back door. He could see the emergency sign lit up in the gloom. But when someone stepped out between him to block his aisle... Dex knew that he had to get serious. He was about six steps from the man when he realized it was Gino. The old pirate grinned at him, brandishing a push broom like a spear as he prepared to bring it down on the fleeing kid. Dex didn't know if he could see his smile as well as Dex could see his, but he hoped he could. Dex had been waiting a long time to do this, and as he closed his eyes, he hoped it would be enough to send the fat old meatball out of his way. He concentrated pushing that unknown force in his mind out, and when the man went sprawling into a chip display, Dex whooped in joy. He jumped over the splayed legs and hit the door with both hands. The siren never went off, lack of power and all, and as he came into the alley, he saw a wizard waiting for him. He was shaking his head, but smiled as he saw the little pile of food in his arms. Nice one! Sorry it took so long, I... We gotta go! Dex yelled, pulling him along. There would be time later for regaling Wizard with the heist, but now it was time to escape. He could hear the people inside as they 
tried to get a handle on the situation, and Dex wanted to be far away when they finally got it all sorted out. This could still go south, and he knew that even if they were quick, they might still get caught if they weren't. The sound of Gino Mazer bellowing in sudden anguish turned both boys towards the back door. The man was standing in the semi-darkness, his face stuck half in shadow as the light from the chased bulb hit the massive gun in his hand. It looked like a cannon, like something that would blow a hole clean through you, and when he leveled it at them, shouting that hated word that both boys had heard since they were old enough to contemplate that it was an insult. They were powerless to do much but stop and stare like deer in the headlights of a semi-truck. Dex ready to blast, wanting to stop him before he could fire, but it was too far away and the voice of thunder erupted too soon. Dex closed his eyes, prepared to open them in the hereafter, but was rewarded with nothing besides a sudden hot spray across his cheek. He opened his eyes and assessed himself, finding his body much as it had been before Gino's comically large weapon had gone off. One look at Wizard, however, showed him that he had not been so lucky. The boy's shirt had a hole in it that seemed much too big. The ragged edges were spreading blood across the surface, and Wizard was looking at him as if to beg him to make it stop. As he fell, Dex could see that the hole in his back was even bigger, and when Dex caught him mid-fall, his arms were soon red with the boy's blood. This wasn't right. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. No one should be shot in the street over $17.38 worth of groceries. Dex knew he should go, but his wizard lay there panting his life out. He was helpless to do much more than kneel there and watch his friend die. When someone thumbed the hammer back on that gargantuan firearm, Dex looked up into the inky blackness and marked the end of his life. Told you, boy, Gino panted, clearly enjoying himself. Told you I'd introduce you to something that would stop you from stealing from me ever again. Bet the cops give me a medal when they get here. They'll probably thank me for cleaning up the streets. Dex closed his eyes again, preparing to hit the murderous bastard with the biggest brain blast yet. But he never got the chance. He jumped when a shot rang out, but when something clattered to the ground beside him, he opened his eyes and found Gino's gun beside him. He looked up to find the fat old greaseball wobbling on his suddenly unsteady legs. There was an impressive stink in the air as his bowels let go, but that wasn't what caught Dex's eye as he scuttled out of the way of the falling man. He pulled Wizard along with him, and the man missed them by inches as he collapsed onto the filthy ground beside his own garbage cans. Dex had seen the hole where his left eye had been, and one look at Wizard showed him that the boy had only outlived his killer by seconds. He was sitting in an abattoir now, keeping company with the dead. Shit, Reynolds! Someone yelled, and Dex jumped as he saw the two men from inside the shop coming into the alley. What the hell did you have to kill him for? He was about to off both of them, the man said, taking a handkerchief out of his pocket before wiping down the gun. Site management was pretty clear that we needed at least one of them. Dex had dropped Wizard and was backpedaling nimbly as he could. This whole thing had gotten out of control, and now he wasn't sure what was happening. Wizard was dead. Gino was dead. These guys were talking about him like he was... Something they'd been prepared to pick up at the store. Just like groceries. A little shopping before home. That was Dex. The man stooped when he came to Wizard and put the gun in his hand. Besides, I didn't shoot him. Kid killed him. About a second after he shot him. A botched robbery. Thwarted assault. Who cares what they call it? Dex grunted when his back came up against the big green dumpster that took up half the alleyway. He was trapped. The man sighed as he slid something out of his pocket, this gun much smaller and delicate looking than the one he had put in Wizard's hand. Well, kid, you're not the one they wanted, but you'll do. Dex had been trying to get himself under control so he could hit these two with a brain blast and escape, 
but when the little gun barked and a dart suddenly sprouted from his shoulder, he forgot to be afraid as a feeling of warmth washed through him. He was suddenly tired, the adrenaline losing the fight for control as he drifted off. Someone was carrying him. Someone was putting him in the back seat of a car. Someone was climbing in behind him as someone else drove. He could see the blue and white lights dancing by as they passed them, and whoever was in the back with him was securing his arms and putting something over his head. The last thing he remembered before passing out was the man who had shot him, talking to someone that he couldn't hear. We got the other one. Yeah. Yes, sir. No. Williams was a wash. Shot after an attempted robbery. No, sir. No witnesses. We're, we're heading back. ETA. But Dex passed out at that point and wouldn't know any more for quite some time. By then, he'd already be in the kindergarten. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists, or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them, shall we? Thanks to Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributor. Thanks to Janet and Lady Vengeance for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you think you might like to support the show in a more monetary fashion, come on down to Patreon. I have many tiers. I'm sure you'll find one that suits you best. I always recommend the Ghostly Reader tier, since you get a signed book anytime I write one on your doorstep. But I have many tiers, and again, I'm sure you'll find one to suit you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.